like those little tiny colonies that grow next to those bigger, more clumpy colonies, these are kind of like bacterial freeloaders. They're able to grow along for the ride, even though they don't have the plasmid inside. The plasmid, that is, that contains whatever genetic information we wanted them to have, such as the instructions for making a protein, as well as an antibiotic resistance gene that we can use for selection. I'll go much more into the details, but this is mostly a problem when we're dealing with ampicillin resistance. What happens is we use this resistance gene as a selectable marker called BLA. And BLA is not BLA, it makes beta-lactamase. And beta-lactamase is going to destroy the antibiotics in the beta-lactam class, including ampicillin and penicillin and stuff like this. It's gonna get secreted out of those cells that have the this gene for it. And it's going to protect, therefore, those cells that have it, but also the cells in the surrounding. So what happens if you allow these plates to grow too long is that you're going to get a buildup of this beta-lactamase in the area around the bacteria that have the gene for it. And this is going to allow bacteria that don't have the antibiotic resistance gene to grow. And so they're going to start showing up at these larger later times when you have that buildup of the beta-lactamase breaking down the antibiotics, as well as you have just the antibiotics breaking down even without the beta-lactam activity because ampicillin isn't going to be very stable for long. So to prevent the satellite colony formation, what you can do is you can limit the time that you're growing the plates use fresh antibiotics and make sure that when you go do choose the colony, you're actually choosing the colony that is one of the major colonies and not one of those satellite colonies. And the longer you grow the plate, the harder it's going to be to tell which is which. And so it's another reason to take your plates out of the incubator before it's too late. We use antibiotics a lot in the lab as what we call selectable markers. Basically, we can use the presence of an antibiotic resistance gene in order to select for or only allow to grow bacteria that contain something that we want them to. Typically, what we do is we're sticking a plasmid, so a circular piece of DNA, into bacteria, and this plasmid is going to serve as a vector or vehicle for getting in a piece of genetic information, commonly say the the genetic instructions for making a protein that we want the bacteria to make for us. Now, in addition to having the instructions for making that protein, the plasmid will also have a resistant antibiotic resistance gene. Therefore, if we grow the bacteria in the presence of that antibiotic, only the bacteria that have actually taken in the plasmid will be able to survive. This is important because holding onto that plasmid can actually provide a growth disadvantage for those bacteria. If they're having to maintain this plasmid and they're having to even like make the protein or whatever for you. And so in the absence of the antibiotic, those cells might die out, but in the presence of the antibiotic, only those cells that have the antibiotic resistance gene will be able to survive. We can say that they're being selected for. And this allows us to do all sorts of things with bacteria because we can ensure that only the bacteria that have the plasmid of interest are able to survive, at least in theory. And the problem with these satellite colonies is that these cells are not going to have that antibiotic resistance gene. They're just kind of piggybacking off of the excreted resistance from the nearby plasmid but in the nearby bacterial cell, which is a problem with ampicillin and other beta-lactam antibiotic and beta-lactamase um, resistance genes because those products are going to be secreted. So we use different types of antibiotics in the lab and they target different things in bacteria. When we're talking about these beta-lactam antibiotics, things like penicillin and ampicillin, these are targeting the cell wall. So bacteria have this peptidoglycan cell wall, um, which is made up of these like peptide sugar chains. And in order to link those chains together, the bacteria uses an enzyme or a reaction helper called transpeptidase. And what happens in the case of these antibiotics, these beta-lactam antibiotics, is that they actually kind of mimic the part of the chain that transpeptidase normally attacks and links together. And now when that transpeptidase goes to make that strong wall, 
it's going to actually attack the ampicillin or whatever other antibiotic you have, the beta-lactam antibiotic. The name we get the beta-lactam is because it has this beta-lactam structure, and this structure is going to get attacked by the transpeptidase. It kind of breaks open this beta-lactam ring, and this gets it permanently stuck onto that transpeptidase, so the transpeptidase can't make those strong walls, and the cells aren't going to be able to um, survive and grow in all these different things. Now, what happens in to provide resistance is you have a gene called BLA. And so BLA is going to be beta-lactamase. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to break open that beta-lactam ring before the transpeptidase has a chance to do it. And so it's going to inactivate your beta-lactam antibiotic. And this, this beta-lactamase product, this protein that's going to inactivate the antibiotic, it actually gets secreted by the cells that make it. These cells kind of go on the offensive. They're able to secrete this antibiotic resistance um, product outside of themselves so that they can destroy the antibiotics in their surroundings before those antibiotics can get in and start wreak wrecking havoc. But by doing so, they're also kind of protecting the cells around them. And so the cells around them are going to have the advantage of being in the presence of the antibiotic resistance product of that beta-lactamase the beta-lactamase is going to be destroying the antibiotics in the environment, and then these cells don't have to produce that beta-lactamase themselves, so they're able to be lazy. They can lose that plasmid. And so if they don't have that plasmid, or maybe they never did, they were just kind of somehow hiding out in there. Now what happens is they're going to have a growth advantage because they don't have to be copying that plasmid. They don't have to be doing whatever that plasmid tells them to do. They can do whatever they want to do. And so they're going to be able to survive and thrive in the absence of that antibiotic, thanks to the presence of the nearby cell that was doing all the hard work. And this means that those cells, those satellite colonies, those little colonies that grow that don't have the presence of the antibiotic resistance gene, they're also not going to have whatever else in the plasmid you wanted them to have, and therefore these cells are not the ones that you want to work with. This is especially an issue if you're using a high copy number plasmid. Copy number refers to basically how many copies of the plasmid there are per bacterial cell. Sometimes you have a plasmid with a high copy number. We often use these type of plasmids when we're doing some sort of cloning and we want to get lots of the DNA. Whereas we might use a lower copy number plasmid if we're doing protein expression and we don't want to overwhelm the bacteria by trying to have them make too much protein at once. What happens if you have a high copy number is that each of those copies is going to have a copy of the beta-lactamase gene. So you're going to make a lot of beta-lactamase and therefore you're going to get higher concentrations build up in the media than you would have if you had a lower, concentrate, lower copy number plasmid. So you might use a higher concentration of ampicillin if you have a high copy number plasmid. You might use 100 micrograms per mil, per se, instead of 50. And so the copy number is might impact how much you use. Typically, I just go with 100 for everything. And so when you're choosing what colonies to work with, you want to avoid those satellite colonies. And you also want to avoid the satellite colonies in the first place. And one way that you can do this is by avoiding antibiotic degradation. And so basically you can think about the satellite colonies as forming not only because the cells are benefiting from the breakdown from beta-lactamase, but also from the breakdown from the antibiotics kind of just going bad. As I mentioned, we use a lot of different types of antibiotics in the lab and ampicillin is especially bad for this degradation. It's especially sensitive to it. For some of these other antibiotics, not only are they a little more stable, but also they don't have that issue where they're secreted, and so satellite colonies are less of an issue. So what I'm going to talk about mainly is going to apply to ampicillin, um, which is one of the main ones we use in the lab, and also one of the ones that's really, really problematic in the terms of satellite colony formation. Thankfully, there are easy ways to avoid these satellite colonies. One is don't use old plates. So these LB agar plates that we grow bacteria on, ideally you don't want to use ones that are more than a few weeks old 
although we often use ones that are much older. But don't add antibiotics to hot media. So when you go to cool those, when you go to pour those plates, make sure that you let the LB agar cool enough to, to the point where you're going to pour them and you can pour them without having to wear like gloves, special gloves. You can touch them with your hands. At that point is when you want to add the antibiotic right before you pour them rather than another time. And remember that the satellite colonies, you're able to see them when they're on a plate. But what's happening if you grow these bacteria in liquid media is you're still going to have this secretion. You're still going to have that potential problem of there being cells in there that don't have the plasmid. You're just not going to be able to see them. The nice thing about colonies is that you have these individual clumps of genetically identical bacteria. So basically one bacteria takes um, takes root and it kind of just grows around, grows on top of itself. It, it copies and copies and copies itself. And so you get this gluey clump and all that should be genetically identical. And then those satellite colonies around it, those might not have the plasmids, but that one big colony should all be the same thing. What happens in the case of a liquid media is here everything's all kind of mixed together. And so you're not going to be able to go and select for that colony that actually had your plasmid, avoiding those satellite colonies. Instead, they're all going to be mixed together. And remember that those satellite, what would have been a satellite colony, which is now just some of the bacteria in that liquid mixture, they're going to have a growth advantage and they can outgrow the, the bacteria that actually have your plasmid and cause problems. It might not be as big of an issue in liquid culture because you're gonna have that beta-lactamase be diluted out a bit. So basically when you have a plate, you're gonna have this really high local concentration of beta-lactamase around that colony, which is why the satellite colonies grow right around that big colony rather than being spread out all over the plate. In a liquid culture, you're going to have that beta-lactamase be diluted out over the entire thing. So it's kind of like it's helping everything but less. Whereas with the plate, you're helping only the things near you, but you're helping them a lot. So not only do you want to make sure that you're adding the antibiotic to the cooled media before you pour the plates, but also before whenever you're doing that bacteria. So you, um, whenever you're preparing media, you want to add the antibiotics right before you go to use it. And so don't store the antibiotics in your LB, instead add it to the LB right before you're ready to add your bacteria to the media. Don't allow the plates to overgrow in order, it, when you're doing the, back to the plates, don't allow them to overgrow. So typically you're going to be spreading the plates. So you plate the bacterial cells in like the afternoon and then you grow them overnight in the incubator at 37 degrees Celsius. When you come in the next morning, you should see colonies and the colonies might not be that big, but as long as they're big enough to like select and use, you can go ahead and take the plates out. Don't wait for the colonies to get really big because the longer you wait, the more satellite colonies can form, the more breakdown of the antibiotics you can get, as well as the more buildup kind of of that beta-lactamase outside of the cells. And so just take those plates, wrap them in parafilm to seal them and stick them in the fridge, um, stick them in upside down so that any condensation that forms is going to drip down onto the lid and not onto the plate. And you can also consider using a more stable beta-lactam antibiotic. So remember that the beta-lactam co name comes from this having this, what we call a beta-lactam structure, which is kind of this constrained ring. This is really awkward and it's going to be vulnerable to attack by the transpeptidase. And so the transpeptidase, that enzyme that's going to be involved in making those bacterial cell walls, it's going to be able to attack that site and it's going to break that open. And once it's broken open, it's kind of going to get stuck on the stuck on the transpeptidase, inactivating that transpeptidase so it can't build the cell walls. There's also a bunch of other bells and whistles to these antibiotics, though. And so you can see that ampicillin has got all this other stuff sticking off on it. In addition to having this beta-lactam ring, it's got all this unique stuff. And if you look at other antibiotics, so this is another beta-lactam, you see penicillin, it's got a slightly different stuff hanging off of it. And since it's that beta-lactam part that's the most important, scientists can design or use antibiotics that are actually produced by other bacteria to make um, more stable versions of antibiotics. And so one of these antibiotics that can, is more stable 
is carbenicillin. So it's going to be more resistant to the degradation, but it's also more expensive. And so commonly people just use ampicillin, but if you're having a lot of problems with this, um, with the loss of the plasmid or with satellite colonies and things like this, you can consider switching to something like carbenicillin. So remember that beta-lactamase is going to get secreted and therefore it's going to break down the antibiotic in the media. This is only an issue if you break down enough of the antibiotic that cells around it can survive. If you still have enough of the antibiotic present, then the cells won't have, because they can't make their own beta-lactamase, they only are relying on the little bit that's in the media, if the antibiotic concentration is high enough that, there's, that the beta-lactamase can't keep up, then those cells aren't going to be able to survive. So you can overcome the beta-lactamase um, concentrations by having a higher concentration of the antibiotics. And you can do this by preventing those antibiotics from degrading, potentially using higher concentrations of antibiotics and or adding more antibiotics partly through. And in the case of plated cells, you can see those bacteria colonies that don't have the antibiotic resistance gene start growing off of the sides of those bacterial colonies as these little satellite colonies. And when you go to use your bacteria, you go to select a colony to work with, you want to avoid those and just choose those bigger colonies, the ones that actually have the antibiotic resistance gene. There's a lot of research being done into like persister cells. So basically these are bacteria that they don't have the resistance, but they're able, or at least classical resistance, they don't have that beta-lactamase gene, but they're able to kind of enter this dormant state where they just kind of go like metabolically silent. They're just kind of, just kind of hibernating until conditions are better. Once those, that resistant bacteria can kind of clean up all the environment, then those dormant cells can kind of reactivate and now they can grow. And so this is a key thing too, when people are talking about how we can avoid antibiotic resistance when we're actually like treating infections and things like this, a problem is you can have those persister cells that are going to be able to survive in this dormant state um, and then kind of reactivate after you thought you cleared the infection. And for anyone who wants to know more of the technical details about what's going on, I found this cool article by Nadani et al. Um, Live to Cheat Another Day, Bacterial Dormancy Facilitates the Social Exploitation of Beta-Lactamases. And it's pretty cool. It goes into some of the things about growth disadvantages provided by having that beta-lactamase gene about the presence of the beta-lactamase in, me in the media and the effects on the surrounding cells, all sorts of cool stuff like this. And so for those um, hardcore hardcore geeks out there like me, you might enjoy this article. And so I'll post a link to it.